Everyone who is watching, welcome to the live discussion panel for our screening of the PBS documentary, uh, Dreamland, Little Rock's West Ninth Street. This is the second screening event in our ongoing film series um, called Black Representation Matters in Film and Beyond, which we're doing in conjunction with the Wingate Museum of Art's current exhibition, Let Us March On, which is an exploration of the Black Lives Matter movement in Arkansas. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's screening, be sure to join us for our next one on Friday, October 16th in two weeks. We'll be showing Cheryl Dunye's 1997 film, The Watermelon Woman. It's going to be great. But uh, tonight I'll introduce myself. My name is Sophia Stolke. I'm a student film associate at the WMA. Uh, me and my awesome co-curator Jasmine Chambly are very excited to have everyone here tonight. And I'd like to start off by introducing our wonderful panelists who are here with us tonight. So first off, I'll introduce Christina Schutt. She currently serves as the executive director for the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center, which is the African American Museum of History and Culture for the state of Arkansas, located right on West 9th Street. Um, prior to her tenure at Mosaic Templars, she served as associate librarian for special collections and instruction at Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas. Um, her co-curated exhibit, Don't Touch My Crown, won the 2019 Arkansas Museums Association Award for Outstanding Exhibition, uh, proving her vision to build a museum where programming is inclusive, collaboration is embraced, and rich and vibrant stories of African Americans in Arkansas is widespread. Uh, next up, we have Stephanie Harp. Stephanie is a writer and historian whose family ties to Little Rock and elsewhere in Arkansas go back many generations. She currently lives in Bangor, Maine, and she holds a master's degree in U.S. history that focuses on lynching, specifically John Carter's murder in 1927. In 2013, she organized and led the Project 27 presentation at Mosaic Templars and has presented her work at Without Sanctuary, a conference on lynching in the American South in 2012 um, at the Arkansas Historical Association and many other places. Um, and we also have joining us Tanisha Jo Conway. She's spent over 24 years working with public affairs television. And during this time, she has and continues to develop, produce, and coordinate public affairs programming for Arkansas PBS. Uh, Joe Conway's work has won numerous awards, including several regional Emmy nominations and two wins. And she served as the producer of the film screen tonight, Dreamland, Little Rocks West 9th Street. And before I hand it off to our moderator, Dr. Barth, I'll introduce him. Dr. Jay Barth is a former ME and Ima Graves Peace Emeritus Professor of Politics at Hendricks College. He is also a Chief Education Officer for the City of Little Rock coordinating the city's work to support education from birth through higher education in Little Rock. He also presently serves as vice chair of the Downtown Little Rock Community Development Corporation and as a member of the boards of Central Arkansas Water, the ACLU of Arkansas, and Planned Parenthood Great Plains. So thank you everybody for joining us and I'll hand it over to Dr. Barth. Great, thanks Sophia and thanks to everyone for spending their Friday evening with us including uh, the the folks who are on the panel and I appreciate y'all spending this time. I did want to uh, note that uh, if you have comments or questions, um, um, you can uh, include those in the chat box and uh, Jasmine will transfer those over to me. And so we, we certainly want to um, include any questions or comments that folks have uh, who just experienced the film uh, for the first time. Um, I've, I've uh, watched this film, I guess, three or four times now and uh, am um, always struck by something new, but in particular am kind of consistently struck by just how much is in this film. In an hour long film, I don't know that I've ever seen a documentary that not only covers so much time period, but also, uh, covers so many different uh, substantive issues, and it's just really uh, a masterful film, uh, I think, in that uh, regard. But I want to spend uh, some time uh, at the beginning really talking about the film as a piece of art uh, before we talk about some of the substance uh, of the film. Um, and so I want to start with a question really about, uh, for Christina and, and Stephanie, and I'll uh, ask Tanisha, who's obviously spent a lot of time with this film, a slightly different uh, version of it. 
Um, what what strikes uh, you as as um, as a public historian and a, a more traditional historian uh, about uh, this story of Ninth Street as told in this film? What what works in this film? What left you with questions as a result of of this film? Um, Stephanie, you want to get us started? Sure. Well, I. Um... I was so impressed with the film. I saw it several years back when it first came out. Um, and I think it's just, it's such a beautiful telling. I mean, I learned, I learned quite a lot. I didn't know, my, my research was pretty confined to the John Carter story and events surrounding it. And so, I mean, I knew that Ninth Street was, you know, um, the well-known and vibrant district, but I didn't know, I learned so much about it from the film. So I really, Tanisha, I really appreciated the film quite a lot. Um, and I, I think it was well done. I like the way, I like the variety of the people I loved, the people who'd been there. I mean, that was so wonderful to see, you know, have them bring it back to life um, all these years later. And, you know, in my own work, I've done quite a lot of interviewing. And I know there's a kind of a, um, urgency for interviewing folks from, you know, this time period, obviously. Um, because of course they're getting older, times going by, and so uh, I, I just love the way the mo the mod and especially the reproduction as well of the uh, the recreation of the scenes in the ballroom. I mean, it just brought it to life in a way that you just have to you, you know you have to imagine it seeing the pictures. But I love the I love the way that was all brought to life. I was I was so impressed with the film. Mm -hmm. Christina. Yeah, I think one of the um, things that the film does really well for uh, for me, but also for us um, at, from the museum perspective is we talk a lot about 630 and about just the impact that 630 had on Little Rock. And I think when you visually see the ways in which 630 separated communities, um, separated um, neighborhoods and separated people. I think um, just that visual representation, that starkness, um, you know, for, and the impact of that, right? The impact of having a city that's more segre geographically segregated, right? And now than it was in 1957 with Little Rock Nine Integrated Central High School. And so um, being able to visually see that, I think is a really, I don't know, it's always something that str strikes me kind of every time I see it. Mm -hmm. So Tanisha, when did uh, when did you start the work on this film? When when was your first conversation about this film? Well, it was a it was an interesting journey um, to get to this film, and I want to say um, thank you so much for having me. But also thank you to everyone who's spoken about the film. I mean, this is amazing. We don't normally get to hear this kind of feedback about a film. You know, whether it's the good or the bad, we like to hear it all to grow, of course. But initially, I was not um, supposed to be a part of this film. Um, it came to us from um, Berna Love, who wrote the two books that um, we started our research on about West 9th Street and also about Taborian Hall and, um, and also Carrie McCoy. And so they were thinking about a story about just that particular building, the architecture of the building, you know, what was in that building and that sort of thing. And so they came to AETN and pitched it and it went to a different producer. Um, he eventually left um, Arkansas PBS and so the director of production asked me if I wanted to take over producing the film and I was thrilled. Um, had no idea what we were about to get Ooh, into. What's that, Tanisha? What, what so, year? Um, that was, it took us four years. So um, I would say that was about 2014. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was asked to take over at that point. And when we started researching, the very first thing that Gabe, who did an amazing job, um, and also Lucas Morales, our editor, but um, the thing that struck me was that we couldn't tell the story of just that building. We would have done such a disservice, I think, if, had we just focused on the building. The building has a major, amazing history, but that history is tied to that entire street and especially to the people who made that street what it, what it was, so vibrant, so alive and those sorts of things. So we immediately you know, went to work um, trying to pull it together. So that's how, how I came to be a part of it. And um, we just started digging in and it was a long journey for some of the reasons that some of the other panelists have mentioned because not only is it hard sometimes to find people, but it's hard to get them to speak um, because either they've been shut down over time, you know, or they've been misrepresented 
or, you know, so it was very hard even when we found people um, to get them to be ready to tell their story. So Tanisha, how has your um, view of the film changed across time? I mean, as you, you know, obviously got some distance from it now from, from when it came to be, how, do, how, does, how does it feel different now as you think about or experience the film now as opposed to when you were, you know, deep in the trenches? Well, you know, when you're in the trenches, sometimes you get covered up with the, of course, the minutia of it all. You know, speaking about the recreations and the reenactments, those were some hard days. I mean, that place is neither heated nor cool. And we had all of that equipment and all, those, all of that sweat was absolutely authentic. All of that research to see what goes into the building, what we can put in there, how long we can keep people in there. So those were some very hard days. Some of the interviews were, were you, you know, just fascinating. I mean, we have some people who talk to us for six to eight hours. So we have so much footage that we'd love to be able to do something with at some point. But um, right then, I was right in the emotion of it all. Um, and, and toward the end, it was like, it was like finishing up this, this project. But then you start looking at it, and each time I think there was something else that hits me. You know, there'll be something about Mr. Majors absolutely telling you what happened up and down that street that just strikes you every single time. I don't think you can watch and not go, Mr. Majors just grabs you. And the fact that he passed away a few weeks right before the premiere of the film. Um, you know, and then there were, there were just so many things that I learned along the way. My husband's from Little Rock, and he said he had never been told the history of West 9th Street. And so um, back then there are so many emotions. And then of course, like, how could this happen? How could we be sitting now and it be in the state it's in and nobody be already championing the cause or trying to help people who are championing the cause move things forward? Um, looking at it right now with what's going on in the world, I think it makes me go, I wish more people were seeing it um, just for the historical value of it. Because when everything broke out and they were blocking, you know, when the protesters went down to 6.30 and everybody was like, 6.30, what's big about 6.30? And I was like, oh my goodness, you need to know what's big about that area. And so um, it just hits in a lot of different ways, but right now I'm in, we need to know the history to know where we are. Mm -hmm. Well, Stephanie, let's, let's talk about one of those kind of, kind of crucial historical moments that obviously gets um, uh, a key, is a key portion of this film and that is the the, the 1927 lynching of, of John Carter. Could you talk a little bit about your, um, you, you obviously know lots of details about that. What's your, what's your sense of, of how, how well this film captures the, um, the essence of that moment and its impact and, and what might you have, you know, maybe in, incorporated that, that didn't make the cut? Huh. Well, I'm actually glad that um, the film doesn't spend more time on the lynching than it does, than it did. I mean, I think it was a good summary, but I think that it, by, there's so many wonderful things about 9th Street and the history of 9th Street that that, and that was such a, a horrible, you know, piece of it that I think, I, th I think, well, I think that it lays, the film lays out really well why 9th Street was so symbolic and why the, the, 5,000 white people rioted at the corner of 9th and Broadway because obviously they didn't do it. They could have, they could have, they'd already been done plenty that day and they could have been anywhere, but they chose that corner because they understood how important that corner was. And I think the whole film really drives that home. Um, so, I mean, I mean, that was, to me, that was the biggest takeaway is that this contextualizes the importance of Ninth and Broadway, really. I mean, Broadway's not, I don't, I'm not sure Broadway specifically mentioned, but it contextualizes why, you know, right there in front of Bethel AME Church and right there by the Mosaic Templars building. I mean, that was, you know, as they said, anchored the one, the other end of, of it. And so they couldn't have really chosen, it seems to me, uh, they couldn't have really chosen a more appropriate look, I'm uh, not appropriate, sorry, a more, they couldn't have chosen a location that had greater impact with for the intended message of racist intimidation because that's clearly obviously what all of that was about what the, the message that the white crowds wanted to send and you know mm -hmm. so they knew what they were doing it wasn't an accident mm -hmm. so i was really happy to see that you know 
I, I was very happy to, as I said, to put for, for the film to put the whole the whole the whole area into context for the people who, you know, who maybe didn't know about the lynching and say, well, why did they choose there? Well, this is why. So that yeah. Yeah. So Stephanie, actually, a uh, question on the lynching has has popped up that. Uh, well, I think now is the appropriate time. Um, uh, Guy, Can Guy Lancaster, who's done obviously a lot of uh, writing on, on racial violence in Arkansas, uh, asked uh, whether the lynching of John Carter was uh, the best, best attended uh, lynching in terms of the size of the mob. Um, and, uh, and then he does, I think where you were getting at the end, ask about the importance of, of selecting that location. But but could you talk a little bit about just the scope of that event in terms well, of compared sure. to other, uh, other lynchings either in Arkansas or elsewhere in the region? Sure. Well, Guy's actually, hi Guy, <laughs> um, he's actually probably better versed in the details of all the other lynchings in Arkansas than I am um, and could speak to that. But the, I mean, there was a crowd, well, there was, there was multiple crowds. Um, there was a crowd at the jail looking for Lonnie and Frank Dixon. And then there was a crowd at the walls at the penitentiary looking, a, a thou, you know, a thousand people looking for them also. And then several days go by and then the incident with John Carter with the women in the wagon happens. And then there's a crowd of a thousand, a posse that comes streaming from Little Rock with sheriff's deputies and you know other law enforcement um so there's a thousand people there i mean presumably there's overlap through all of these um of people but then finally after after they get to ninth and broadway there's a crowd of five thousand white people five thousand people at that corner and they're screaming and they're yelling and there's the bonfire and they start firing guns into the air you know i mean there's been a lot of talk nationally lately about protest versus riot and how do you define these things. They're breaking into buildings and burning pews from Bethel Church, you know, and they're screaming and yelling and jumping and firing in the air. I mean, this is a riot for sure. Um, so, the, I mean, the, the Gazette the next day called it a Saturnalia of savagery. Um, and, I mean, obviously it led to well, that was the time of the flood, the, the great Mississippi Valley flood as well. I mean, I can go on and on. I know you don't want to probably um, a whole lot of details here, but um, there, you know, it was a, it was a great, there was shame in a lot of official corners, official white corners in Little Rock and in Arkansas as a whole, because the eyes of the world were on the Delta because of the flood. And, uh, you know, this made headlines all over the country. I mean, you know, white, black newspapers. I mean, it was all over the country, obviously, New York Times, I mean, everywhere um, in the days that followed it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, so Christina, you, you go to work every day at that corner at, at 9th and Broadway at the, yeah. at the museum. Could you talk a little bit about how the choices your, um, your museum makes about uh, the presentation regarding Ninth Street and kind of the broader Black experience in in our, in Little Rock and and could you kind of talk about what what might be uh, reflective of this film, but also what might be kind of some things that that are crucial to also understanding the broader broader issues and context. Yeah, so for us, we always think about oppression in the context of survival. Um, so it's not just that um, that John Carter was oppressed, you know, that he was lynched or that black people were oppressed, but that um, that there's also survival and thriving in the midst of this. And I think that's one way in which um, the film and the museum probably dovetail each other really well, um, because we talk about both of those things. Right. It's a it's a both and not an either or. Um, because I think oftentimes when people when we talk about um, particularly 
um, victims of, of lynching or other for, forms of racial terror, we often stop the story there. And one of the ways that the museum has really um, worked in the last few years is to um, continue the story, right? To talk more about John Carter's life, to talk about his family, to talk about other things outside of just, um, you know, his mutilated body. Um, and that goes with, I mean, not just him, but uh, the Elaine massacre, you know, which of course the hundredth anniversary of that was last year. And so even talking about these other kind of large scale um, racial terror, racial violence in Arkansas, you know, letting people understand that there was, there was community there uh, that, um, you know, that there was a reason, right? It's been kind of echoed. There was a reason why these things um, happened <laughs> in certain places. Um, so I think that's a, a big part of um, of what we do and what we think about um, when we're talking about about kind of contextualizing this for people. The other thing is under helping people understand that it didn't just stop. Um, that lynching you know, in a traditional sense, um, we think about lynching um, or racial terror lynching and didn't just stop with John Carter, right? That um, just because that was the last physical lynching in, in Little Rock didn't mean that there weren't other ways in which both Jim Crow laws and other forms of um, overt and kind of covert oppression um, happened within um, and towards the black, particularly the black community, I would say that there's a very much a sort of anti-black sentiment. And so again, giving people that context that um, that wasn't the period in the story, but the comma. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, we we had another question. I think now may be a, a good time to to integrate that. I may probably turn to a little bit to Tanisha and, and Christina on this. Um, Barry Goodwin uh, asks. Um, I knew a little about the I knew a little about the highway construction's role in the demise of Ninth Street but I didn't know anything about the urban renewal push before tonight. Uh, can you speak more about that as a movement um, in, a little, in Little Rock and I guess beyond Little Rock as well and its impact? Who wants to, anybody wanna kind of pick up with the urban renewal piece of the, of the story here and, and add some more insight into that? Um, I'll start a little bit. I'm not an expert in it in any sort of way, but um, I will say that as we were researching, um, this was a nationwide, um, a nationwide phenomenon. It wasn't just um, in Little Rock, but as we were researching the film, you know, it was like several of the folks that we interviewed quickly wanted us to realize that it was like, you know, one of the hardest blows because all of a sudden you separated um, this community where the money could flow up and down that street. Um, you know, and we've heard some people say they think it may have turned over eight times on that street before it left because there were, you know, everything they needed was right there on that street. So you imagine how much money was turning over in the hands of, you know, of the folks on 9th Street. So with the, with the highway coming through and blocking off that, then it sent people other places. So a lot of those businesses, of course, lost that money, that, that, that revenue went to other places. But not only that, um, several people like Mr. Um, Kenneth Brown, who um, who talks about this often, and um, he he mentioned to us, you know, you got to think that they they didn't hear the truth about what was happening, you know, because part of it is still there. So some of that could have still been there. Some of it could have been saved, but they weren't in those doors to hear about it. But I think the most important thing to to realize is that it wasn't just Arkansas. It was across the whole country, and that's urban renewal. Um, that's the the highways. You know, when you look at some of those some of those ha homes in there, they they weren't blighted. You know, so why why were they torn down at that point? So it's like you have to think that that was that intention. You know, there were there were reasons behind it, and there were there were other things, and you know, other consequences too. Some people say, you know, what's well, the price of progress? Well, whose progress are we speaking on, and at what cost to the people who were already there? Good. Christina, anything or any, any, uh, either you are Stephanie, but Christina. Yeah. So I, I would add um, first that being the librarian I am, I'm going to recommend a book. It's called The Color of Law. Um, and I know a lot of folks on the call have probably read it, but um, it's an excellent um, deep dive into kind of how urban renewal worked 
Um, and one of the things that the film kind of touches on, um, but a little bit deeper into it, is just how widespread it was. Um, so not only the nationwide impact, but in how many industries it touched. Um, and so I'm thinking about things like, um, and I don't remember the exact date, but um, you know, African Americans couldn't be realtors for the longest time. <laughs> um, and so when you think about buying a home in a neighborhood and you can't go to a black realtor to buy a home, right? Then that means that you're only going to buy homes in certain neighborhoods. Um, they're not going to sell homes. You know, we've had stories of people at the museum, you know, uh, visitors who have come in and shared about um, them or their parents where they tried to buy a home in a white neighborhood and the ways in which they were shunned or excluded, um, the ways in which they had to do things covertly. So um, there was a gentleman who would buy a white gentleman who would buy homes like and then he would sell them to the black people like secretly. <laughs> um, so, be, and again, this isn't just Little Rock this happens in, but across the country. Um, and so when you think about industries like that, so you've got the realtor industry, you've got the banks who won't give loans to African-Americans, um, not only in housing, but um, even in farming. So Arkansas is a very rural state and um, there was a, a case um, with uh, Pigford um, in the 90s, it was finally settled that said that um, basically the USDA, so the federal government had denied African-American farmers uh, farm loans. And so, again, thinking about it, even in other industries, like that's how widespread um, the discrimination was. Um, and that discrimination is really what's driving uh, this urban renewal, right? It's what drives the um, exclusion. You know, I'm originally from Kansas City, and uh, there was a, a book that came out a couple of years ago talking about urban renewal in that context. And one of the things that I learned in reading it was that I had no idea, having grown up in the city, you know, being a, a historian, public historian for many years, um, but that the boulevard systems were uh, a way in which to um, segregate communities, that they actually designed these wide boulevards as a way to do that. So um, we see it in all sorts of cities. Um, in Boston, it was the public transportation that was used as a way to drive urban rural urban renewal there. So um, buses only go to certain neighborhoods. The Even to this day, the mass transit, the subway, um, doesn't go to certain neighborhoods um, of my, particularly minority communities, uh, marginalized people of color communities. So again, that's driving um, this sort of urban renewal even today and the impact that we feel for it. Great. That, and that book, just for folks, it's uh, Richard Rothstein's uh, Color of Law, and um, it really, I think, does does capture the government's role in, um, in 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 shaping this. And you know, Tanisha, you know, made the comment about you know um, intent. Uh, I think they're in, 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 in proving intent in some of these decisions, and I I, I do think Rothstein makes a, a really good case for for um, for, for intent. Um, the, Christina, you were beginning to, I think, talk about some comparisons between um, the Ninth Street story in Little Rock and, and the stories in other cities. Um, and uh, so we had a question about uh, comparisons of what happened in Tulsa at Greenwood, the uh, very famous uh, events of uh, uh, about six or seven years before uh, what happened um, um, with the, the, the Carter lynching. Um, similar, similar area in a lot of ways. Uh, obviously, we have other cases uh, around the, uh, the region uh, and, and nation that feel very similar. Could y'all talk a little bit about um, uh, how the Little Rock case, the Ninth Street case, is kind of alike and different uh, from, from some of those other uh, cases uh, around, uh, around the, the region? Um, in terms of the economic vibrancy, but also then the, the way in which the story unfolds. Um, so, yeah, so in the yeah, Tulsa the, case, so the Tulsa massacre happens in 1921. So they're already starting um, some of the commemoration activities even now. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, of course, it happens in the Greenwood district that everyone kind of 
Penn's is Black Wall Street. Um, and Ninth Street and Greenwood would have been very similar um, in terms of the kinds of things they offered, the communities, the kinds of people who lived on the street or near the street, around the street. One of the things that makes, I think, Little Rock so different was the way in which um, Black leadership really um, tried to do whatever they could to protect the Black community and the citizens. And so they were, um, people like Scipio Jones and others were very quick to say, like, go to your homes, um, get out of the community, you know, go places so that you're not here. <laughs> um, because of course the, the incident in Greenwood um, just like with the John Carter, right? It's a, it's a powder keg kind of situation. And um, so I think that's one of the ways that um, they really become a little bit different um, and some of their impact. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, any thoughts on, on, on those comparisons? Yeah, I think that's a good one. Um, I, I, it, yeah, the, the, Greenwood was the vibrant area, just like, uh, just like Ninth Street. Um, I mean, fortunately, there were not hundreds of people massacred on Ninth Street. Um, so it didn't turn into that because as, as Christina said, you know, because people stayed home and, you know, went home or hid. I mean, there's stories of business owners who were hiding in their, in their stores that would then after the National Guard finally arrives and um, disperses the white crowd, the, the business people, you know, somebody comes out of their store and says, you know, gets an escort home. Um, but there's, you know, people staying, staying home and turning off their lights because, you know, what these armed white men are start marauding around the neighborhood looking for people. So, um, you know, things could have been a whole lot worse than they already were. Uh, if not for the actions of, as, as Christina said, of course, like Sophia Jones and other leaders telling people to like, just like, you know, don't be part of this. And I mean, very possibly, of course, the, what happened in Tulsa informed their reactions and their response to it, because um, obviously they knew about what had happened and didn't want Little Rock to get worse than it already was. Thanks. Tanisha, anything to add there? Well, I think um, just a couple of, of general things along when we were researching the film. Um, I remember finding at some point, and I can't remember right now whether it was Essence or Ebony Magazine, but there was an article in there that spoke about how um, Ninth Street in Little Rock was so much more spectacular and amazing than Bill Street in Memphis. And so it was like you find these things and you're like, wow. You know, this is what we had. This is what was was right there. That whole legacy that was right there. And you look at kind of like when Daisy mentioned in the film, with where we are, and at least you know them having some of the structures that they have and some of the things that they're able to have. So when you you know you think about some of that, but it but it did. It really did happen. I've been I was struck over time with the number of people who talked about things that happened in their local communities once we did the film. You know, it was like all of a sudden folks were like, oh, I remember my grandmother told me this story about things that happened even within Arkansas. You know, we know it happened in different areas across the country, but all of a sudden we were starting to get more stories. And that's that's from the black experience and also from the white experience. I received a call from a, a lady um, here in Conway, um, a white lady who lived just off 9th Street. And she was so excited after the film happened um, because she felt she could finally tell her story which was that as a little girl, um, she used to walk down 9th Street during the day on her way to a school or a store or somewhere that she used to frequent. And she was like, she loved it um, because everybody spoke to her. It's like they knew who she was. They were gonna make sure that she didn't get into any trouble. And she was like, and nobody ever told, you know, how, how amazing that was. And she mentioned that she and her father would stand outside on the weekend to listen to the jazz and to listen to the music on the street and just to be around. And so she felt this sense of, you know, um, community in a certain way with, you know, she wasn't afraid of the, of, you know, the folks on that street because she had her own little experience with them. And um, she said, so thank you for just telling the story and even enlightening her more on what they were feeling at the same time that she was experiencing and feeling what she, what she was feeling. And I think that's one of the important parts of it is 
you know, um, allowing everybody to tell their story helps us to cre create um, a real sense of the entire story. Um, and, and also, you know, like knowing um, Black, you know, knowing about Tulsa, knowing about 9th Street, knowing about some of these other places, it really does help us get a broad view um, of how widespread it was. And one other thing that I mentioned that's kind of along those lines is like with Florence Price. You know, um, there were so many families that left after um, the lynching of John Carter. You know, what were those differences in the people who left? I mean, she had this amazing music career from Arkansas and all of this, but you know, of course it was like right after that happened, the family was like, we gotta leave. So how did all of that sh change and shift the people who were um, in these communities? Yeah, that's great. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions about I-630 and we'll, we'll go there in just a minute, but, but I think now's the time to maybe talk a little bit about um, about 9th Street today. And um, first off, obviously, uh, it's very different from Beale Street, as the film points out, in terms of um, it's, there are, there are a couple of important uh, crucial structures that remain, but there's a lot of, a lot of emptiness uh, on, on 9th Street, a lot of, so um, what, what do we, what's the appropriate thing to do uh, regarding 9th Street today uh, in terms of thinking about uh, rebirth, rebuilding, return to cultural roots, um, or commemoration, including the commemoration of the, of the Carter lynching. I mean, what, what would be your ideal as we do move, uh, Christina suggested, you know, we're moving, uh, we, we're about to head to the, the Tulsa Centennial uh, not too many years from now, we'll be at the at the centennial of the Carter lynching in Little Rock. What what would be y'all's ideal of what Ninth Street should look like and be like um, in in seven years when we get to that date? I don't know how to <laughs> jump on that. Um, other than um, for me, I there needs to be something. I mean, I don't know where to start because I really, when we first released the film, I was hoping that it would just spark something within, you know, folks in the city and they'd be able to get to the legislature and it'd be this, this great thing and we'd be able to at least get markers or, you know, get um, where you can walk down the street and pick up a set of headphones and listen to, you know, this is what happened right here. Or, you know, so at the, at the very least, it would be my desire that something like that could happen. I mean, Christina and everybody at the museum, an amazing job. And I bother them all the time when people want to see the film. But it, it's always amazing to me that um, Gettysburg College and several other folks every year, if they're coming through bring, bringing a new group of students, they want to stop at Mosaic Templars. And they also want, can you show us Dreamland? Can we talk about it? And they, every year, the students talk about how much they love walking from Mosaic um, down to Tabor and Hall and looking at those spaces and how it becomes more tangible to them to be able to talk about public policy in those spaces. So I think it would just be great to have some, some commemoration up and down the street. I don't know how to make it happen. Um, but I, I do think it would just be amazing to have because it's a great teaching tool. Mm -hmm. And I mean, can you imagine bringing kids if we can get out of you know how we are with, with COVID and everything, but down that street so that they can listen to something that you know that happened or listen to to that history and walk it and live it and it be tangible for them so i would love to at least for something like that to happen and at one point i don't know if stephanie or christina know about this i had heard that the family of john carter was actually considering a film just about him and um and that so it'd be nice if we could start doing that i always say that there's so many more films in that footage we cut it a certain way, of course, because we wanted to be able to tell as much as we could, because who knows when we'll get another opportunity, right? But um, there are stories of the churches. There are stories of, you know, even the, the clubs. There are stories of families. There are stories of businesses that, are, are, is, you know, is wrapped up in that. So I would just like to see some sort of commemoration get started and would love to help, um, help work on that. Yeah, I'll jump in about the um, the John Carter stuff. Um, there, yes, the jo the George Fulton Jr. is a filmmaker who is whose grand great grandfather was John Carter. Um, there's some 
identity questions because some of the information that he has from his family doesn't entirely match, but other parts do. So they're still working on researching that. But yes, he's a filmmaker who's been working on um, a documentary for a number of years about that, trying to get some of the, you know, trying to figure out some of these details before he puts it all together. Um, there's also the um, Kwame Abdul Bay at the Arkansas Peace and Justice Memorial Movement has is working with the Equal Justice Initiative to put a memorial a marker out on 12th Street where um, John Carter was actually actually died out there. So that was supposed to happen in May of this year on the fourth, and I was actually planning to come down um, for it, um, but of course that didn't happen. So hopefully it's next year or even remotely. I don't know what's going to happen with that yet. We'll see. But yeah, those are both in the works. That would be fantastic. Yeah, so I'll say that um, yes, yes, definitely on the the marker of the memorial. Um, I think, well, you know, one of the things for me is being able to carry some of what they were doing on 9th Street forward. And so um, I would love to see a complete revitalization of 9th Street. I would love it. Um, you know, we have a couple of like empty kind of vacant lots on the street I would love to see that not be a thing. Um, this past uh, February, we unveiled our Black History Month image, um, which were, were actually eight banners on the side of the building. Um, and we did that, um, and they're massive banners. The longest one is like 92 feet <laughs> um, long. But we did that again, in, in part because um, in a similar vein of Tanisha, this idea of wanting to encourage a sense of revitalization of art and beauty um, in the middle of what feels like a concrete landscape. And so, you know, I would love to see to see some of that um, being really driven forward. You know, on the museum side, one of the things that we're working on doing is actually redoing our entire first floor um, to tell kind of broader story about John Carter and as well as some of the other things um, like the Wrightsville 21 and, and other um, things that have happened in the state that um, in many cases, people didn't know about, um, that people didn't talk about, um, just like we're talking about Tulsa, like no one in Tulsa talked about it, right? It, it, it only became a thing um, for people in the public in a, in a more recent sense. Um, so really being able to encourage that dialogue, encourage that conversation, um, encourage people to, um, to grapple with that history um, and to grapple with not just it as a historical thing, but as something that is part of what we're rooted in now. Like we as Arkansans are rooted in um, and informs all sorts of decisions going forward um, so that, you know, people will have the, the information they need to be able to make informed choices, right? So the next time somebody's talking about putting a 630 size thing in their neighborhood or in their community, they'll be able to say, wait, like who does that cut off? Who does that exclude by doing that? Um, so. And I would, I would say one other thing too, have to um, speak up for, um, for not necessarily Arkansas PBS, but even for having some some shorter pieces. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we had some shorter pieces about events or people along 9th Street that, you know, maybe if Christina doesn't have an hour for a group to watch, but they come in and they're really interested in a certain aspect of the street, you know, that could be a seven to 10 minute little short piece that she could show them about something, you know, just so we can get some of these, um, some some visuals and you know some storytelling done i mean that would be just a great way and christina if i'm speaking out of turn please no not at all but i think that so, no, i'm smiling be because we're literally doing that so oh, that's one great. of the things that we're working on now um as again part of our we're um working to remodel our entire first floor and part of that um retelling of the story of ninth street also involves retelling the story um because there was a ninth street in um hot springs there was a black business district there there was a black business district in west helena you know um, conway had one on markham street that was a black business district so telling more of those stories and showcasing objects and um and narratives from those periods because we want people to understand understand like you probably had a black business district in your town or in your community and no one talked about it and maybe maybe people know about it maybe they don't but if you scratch and I love the way in the film where Kondichi's like like they just paved over this no one dug underneath right and history is kind of like that like if you scratch underneath if you dig a little bit up um, you can often find some really interesting things so no I was just smiling because I was like ah yeah you're you're already thinking of of what we're what we're planning to do 
Yeah. I would, another book I would recommend, uh, uh, the new book on hot springs, the vapors uh, during the, the gambling era. Um, obviously the, 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 the black community in, in hot springs is really crucial to that. And the descriptions of, of that really vibrant uh, entertainment uh, district in hot springs is a, is a, great, uh, a great story as well. Um, Christina made reference to art and beauty, and I'll kind of shift to the antithesis of art and beauty, and that is uh, this interstate that, that, that divides uh, this community, and of course, uh, um, in this film, is shown to divide uh, the, the Black community, um, you know, very clearly in terms of the separation of Taborian Hall from Philander Smith College, these two really crucial um, institutions in this community. Um, we've kind of, uh, another question came in about, about the healing process. And so it, there's one thing about, you know, kind of, um, commemorating Ninth Street, bringing Ninth Street back in some way, but there's also this other issue of, of, uh, of breaking down the division, uh, within, uh, within Little Rock and within communities like it. Um, and so I would love you y'all's thoughts on, on that healing process. What is the way, uh, we obviously can't, can't dig this thing up now um, at this point, it's there, uh, but, but what can we do to create, um, to create reconciliation and, 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 and create more healing um, in that division? And do you see any hopeful signs in that regard? Or are we kind of stuck? Stephanie? Well, yeah, one thing, um, this isn't about 630 exactly, but it is um, a healing thing. In, uh, in 2013, we did a presentation at the Mosaic Templar Center um, about the whole 1927, the, the series of events involving Lonnie Dixon and John Carter and the whole scope of it. And we had on stage, I was there speaking about you know, the history of it. And um, John Kirk and Sharice jones Brands helped us moderate a discussion about it as well. And then we also had the grandson and great-grandson of John Carter. We had the nephew of Fluella McDonald, the little white girl who was killed. And then we had the niece and another one in the um, audience of Lonnie Dixon. And so we all, we, each of us did a presentation and then we had a discussion afterwards and it was a community discussion, maybe 80 people or so were there. I can't remember exactly a number, um, but the, the staff at the time told me afterwards that it was very healing to just be able to, and we all felt it, I think even us on stage as well, just to be able to have this open conversation about this topic that people had talked about in private but hadn't ta been talked about very frequently in public in all these years. Um, and people expressing their, um, you know, the fear that, that lasted for decades afterwards and uh, what's the state of, how is the history taught? And people, they talked about school groups going through, you know, the Templar Center, the museum there, um, and learning the history by going through the different exhibits and whatever. And so, I mean, that was, that was a healing of a sort from, you know, this incident that had happened so long ago, which doesn't, doesn't help the 630 situation, but, um, it, the, the dialogue was really important for everybody who was there, and, and we all felt that it was a, you know, every, all, the, all, the, all the Little Rock folks who were there all talked about it being kind of a healing and cleansing process. Mm -hmm. So conversation <laughs> is the first, is, is, a, is a very crucial first step. Great, thanks. Tanisha? And I would, I would really um, go along with a lot of that. We've recently done a couple of shows um, called Healing the Divide. Um, race relations in Arkansas. We did um, the first one back in June or July, and the second one we did actually, um, what, last night? Um, and it focused on um, um, new, a new generation of activists. And one of the things that one of the one of the 19-year-olds who was on the program said was, you know, we really can't heal what we won't acknowledge. And so she was like, we need to have these sorts of conversations where we bring everybody in and really have people start to kind of in certain ways get over themselves. Cause she was like, if I'm sharing my experience as a, as a, um, as a black woman or as, then that doesn't mean I'm coming at you. So if you can get that part in, in check a little bit, then we can go, go even um, farther into why I feel that way and how we can start to heal. 
but we have to, to get to a point where we have conversations. I was on a panel um, about a year ago in Little Rock and they, um, they said that well over 70 or 80% of, um, of the races, they said that they, they socialize together. And I was like, I don't know where that number came from. Um, I don't know what you consider a socialization because just because I go to work with you and we say hello in the morning um, and goodbye when we leave in the afternoon, that does not mean I've socialized with you. You know, and that does not mean it gave you any more insight about where I'm from or what I've dealt with or what you've dealt with for that matter or a way for us to really start digging into those issues to start healing them. And so I do think that we have to create spaces where we do allow ourselves to hear from people who don't look like us, but even if they look like us, that doesn't mean they think like us. Even if they look like us, you know, that doesn't mean they grew up in the same way that we grew up. So everyone has, we need to, we do need conversation so that we can do that. And then we need to start really talking about, you know, what is your form of activism, which is one of the questions we talk to some of the, the younger folks about. And I will say for them, you know, right now, they're just wide open. It's like, we're ready to go. You know, what is it that we can do? And one of the things I keep saying, I have a soon to be 20 year old. And it is, <laughs> it is a constant thing to talk to her about, okay, you're ready to take to the streets but is that your best form of activism? You know, what is it that you can do to really push the needle? You have folks who are gonna protest, you have people who are gonna do that, but you're also an athlete. You're also a spoken word artist. You are so over here. So how can you, you know, go to your administration at UCA and start talking to them about how we can make a better experience and bring people together? You know, maybe you're the keynote and bringing up some of the issues that you all are feeling to bring people together. So if you think about movements like the civil rights movement, you know, it was like, yes, you had folks who protested and who marched and who did that, but you have folks who were in the courts. You're going to have to have the policy, the legislative, you know, the legislative side, you're going to have to have all of that. And I think in order for healing to take place, we're going to have to get all those different folks in those different realms in the room to really be able to continue to move it forward um, each time. Great. Yeah, I love that you said that, Tanisha, because so I always think about the Montgomery bus boycott and how most people think that it was their protest of not riding the bus that ultimately desegregated the buses in Montgomery, but it wasn't. It was the court case. Um, there was a court case, right, that they were fighting um, at the same time, right, that they were, they were marching with their bodies, and that ultimately is what ended. So this idea of this really kind of multi-pronged, multifaceted approach to problems, thinking about problems in a systematic way, because really many of our problems are system problems, right? Um, it's great to do individual things, and that stuff's definitely important, right? Um, it's important that... Um, you know, as King would say, right, 10 a.m. is the most segregated hour, on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America, right? So it's, it's not just, um, you know, again, looking at who do you go to work with, but who do you really do life with? Who are you in relationship with? You know, can you physically move to another neighborhood? Um, you know, I, we often, you know, hear stories about parents, right, who, um, you know, we all want our kids to go to the best schools, and so they move their kids to different neighborhoods, and with their kids go those tax dollars that underfund those schools, right? Um, so these kind of, again, these perpetual cycles that, that oftentimes, sometimes we individually, right, we can make choices that change those. But it's also um, looking at those bigger problems, right, looking at not just how can I individually be in relationship with someone who doesn't look like me, doesn't think like me, doesn't come from my background, but it's also thinking, okay, how do I use that power um, in the, for the good of other people? Right? How do I use that in the service? Not as a way to talk down or talk over or um, be in front, right? But as a way to support and really stand stand side by side with what they're doing, right? To stand by, stand by side with the work that they've probably already been doing for 20 years, right? Um, that's, I think, what truly makes a lasting changes and lasting impact, you know, and especially in relation to 630, right? It's, it's again, thinking about how do we intentionally, because none of this stuff happens by accident. And I think that we um, collectively, right, as Americans, like, think that, that um, racial reconciliation, that any kind of true healing happens by accident, but it doesn't. 
um, it's intentional. <laughs> um, we have to choose it. We have to make a choice um, every day, like not just a one-time choice, but an everyday choice um, to, to do that, to, to stand up, to do the right thing. Um, and until we start choosing collectively to do those things, right, real change won't happen. And so we start using our power in the service of others, right, not for ourselves, but what ultimately will be will be better for other people and asking them what they want as part of that, right? True change won't happen. Right. And um, I'm going to turn it back here to Sophia in just a second, but uh, we did have one other comment. It was it was a question, but uh, uh, but I think it's it's it, it's it's a question that I think has some Im important um, substance as well in terms of asking about um, what we can learn from the history of I six thirty to prevent further scarring and division as Little Rock looks looks to expand I thirty uh, and the way in which these physical dividers become both physical dividers, but also psychological dividers um, in a community. And, and I think that's an important uh, comment. And Sarah, Sarah Donaghy asked, uh, asked that. Uh, but um, this has been a, a great way to spend Friday night. Uh, I've, had, I've had, this is one of the better Friday nights I've had since March. Uh, so uh, an hour of a great film. And thank you again, Tanisha, for you and all of your colleagues for creating such a, a wonderful piece of art and wonderful thank piece you. of documentary uh, film. But then uh, thank, thank the three of y'all for uh, having a great conversation. And thanks for the questions, the comments uh, that came in as well. And if we were in a physical space, we would certainly applaud you you guys for, for your participation. Uh, so we will do that uh, uh, metaphysically, uh, but, uh, but know that you are appreciated. And I'll turn it back to Sophia to, to end our evening. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining our discussion panel for Dreamland. And special thanks to Dr. Barth for doing a great job of moderating this discussion and to all of our amazing panelists for their excellent contributions to this conversation. And so we hope everyone in the audience enjoyed the discussion. Make sure to tune in on October 16th, uh, Friday, October 16th for a student-led discussion following a screening of The Watermelon Woman as we continue this film series for Black Representation Matters with the Wingate Museum of Art at Hendricks College. So thank you everybody so much. It was so, so good to hear this conversation. It was like a relief. <laughs> I needed this, but yeah, thank you.